This is Dr. Charles Parker, and you're listening to Core Brain Journal. It's the place where I connect both fresh discoveries and interesting different perspectives from advanced mind science with the realities of real people and everyday life down on Main Street. Well, welcome aboard, folks. Dr. Charles Parker here one more time, and we're hosting Core Brain Journal as usual. We appreciate your joining us. We have another very interesting guest. We have so many interesting people that we get a chance to talk to. And so this is Dr. Frozwa Booker-Drew. I get a little messed up with her first name because it is Frozwa. Did I pronounce it correctly? You're so close, so I'm don't worry close, about I'm it. I've, I've been called everything. <laughs> well, you, you can correct me anytime. I think it's very cool. It's, just, it's a very interesting name. And it's Booker Drew, and she is a doctorate-level person who has all kinds of interesting things to talk about that we're going to get into in just a moment. But she is into relations and leadership, and we love the concept of leadership. And she's an author, a speaker, a connector. We're going to talk more about that in just a minute. So before we get started, I'm just going to have a word from our support team, our partners out at Great Plains Laboratory. Core Brain Journal is supported by Great Plains Laboratory. They are deep international biomedical testing leaders for improved targeted mind science details. Last time I checked, the mind was connected to the body. As both laboratory and webinar global thought leaders, they provide the most comprehensive set of biophysical hard data measurement tools for real biomedical answers beyond, hey, guesswork and labels, which is the standard of care. They also provide multiple training webinars for both the public, and this is an important point, medical providers on how to use that really cool data, we use it all the time in course psych, how to use that data effectively with patients in the office. What we like about them is their reports are readable and translatable, and people get them who have no training whatsoever in the biomedical details. So take note of this special offer that they have there. You as a listener, you don't have to be a medical professional. You can register for a complimentary test drawing. That's a test drawing. That's Like, for example, IgG testing, organic acid testing, they do, we have a number of interviews with uh, people here at Core Brain Journal on the toxins. Dr. Walsh uses these people uh, for testing, and uh, Dr. Shaw is the leader at Great Plains, and we've interviewed him too as well. So if you want to go over there and see what kind of tests they have, go to greatplainslaboratory.com and see what's up there, greatplainslaboratory.com forward slash CBJ. That's the link that'll take you to the page where they have the free testing. So you apply for a drawing for the test. So let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Froswell Booker Drew. So she is, as I said, a partnership broker and relational leadership junkie. Oh my gosh. (laughs) She's a connector, an author, a speaker, a trainer, and she has been quoted in Forbes, Ozzy, Bustle, The Huffington Post, and many other media outlets do do an extensive background in leadership, nonprofit management, partnership development, training, and education. She's on it. She's a maven. <laughs> She's currently the director of uh, community affairs. This is what's re- – hold on, folks. Fasten your seatbelt. Listen to this one. The director of community affairs for the State Fair of Texas. And I'm telling you, just talking to her a little bit, she has that wonderful Texas personality, folks, I'll tell you. Are you you living in Austin? No, I'm in Dallas. I actually live right outside Dallas. Yeah, that's okay. You got it. You got it. (laughs) So we love Austin. We had a great time. I do too. Down there at the Broken Spoke one time. We had a great time. So, All right. So she's formerly the National Community Engagement Director for World Vision. She served there as a catalyst partnership broker, and builder for the capacity of local partners in multiple locations across the U.S. to improve and sustain the well-being of children and their families. So she's that's a big deal. She was also part of a documentary called Friendly Captivity, a film that follows a cast of seven women from Dallas to far-off India. She's the recipient of several honors, including a semifinalist 
for the SMU TED Talks. So she's done a TED Talk. I'm going to take that TED Talk. I'm going to put it on your show notes, Carol. That's going to be fun. And I'll put that right there on the show notes here at Corbrain Journal. She's an outstanding African-American alumni award from the University of Texas at Arlington. 2009 Woman of the Year Award by the Zeta Phi Theta Zeta Phi Beta Sorority and was awarded the Diversity Ambassador for the American Red Cross. That's a big deal. She's been around. So the other points that I want to raise here is she attended a Jean Baker Miller Institute at Wesley for training in relational cultural theory, has completed facilitator training on the immunity to change based on the work of Kagan and Leahy at Harvard. She has also completed training through UNICEF. She's the author of two works, uh, pardon me, two workbooks for women, Ready for Revolution, 30 Days to Jolt Your Life and Rules of Engagement. And um, you, I'm, I'm going to let you tease these apart because they're all kind of running together. And Making Connections Last. So there are two. Making Connections Last is a separate book. I got you. Yes. And so she's been a workshop presenter at the United Nations and on the access to power. She was a postdoctoral fellow at Antioch University, adjunct at the University of North Texas in Dallas, and a writer for several publications. Is this girl busy or what? <laughs> I'm Good tired you. listening to it. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Now, you know, this is such a wide thing. I'm going to have to get my tent and my camping gear because we're going to be here. This is <laughs> There's so much to talk about. So this is really great. So the thing, what I always like to do when I'm talking to somebody who's so diverse as you are, is just get a little bit of a narrative of where you came from and how you got into this diversity. And you're really a leader. You're a leader in your teams and many teams around the world. How did you get started with this whole thing? A lot of people would like to know that. You know, I grew up in Shreveport, Louisiana. So that's where you hear the accent. I didn't hear any accent. That's where I got that lovely personality. I haven't <laughs> met anybody from Louisiana that I dislike. I mean, <laughs> so good. We're Street good people. people. We're really good people. Really good people. And they, yes. Uh, the crawfish ball. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yes. Yes. I'm going home this weekend, so I'm looking forward to it. But uh, I grew up in a family of people who were givers. My dad was an entrepreneur and owned a restaurant. And I saw very young people who use their business acumen to make a difference. I remember my dad giving food to people that were homeless. You know, he'd have them work a little bit and do some things. And then he would give people food just to show that just because he had a business, he cared. So the other thing that I saw was people who pushed education. My mom didn't finish college, but my dad did. And my family thought that that was going to be the way to make a difference. And so having those two opportunities to have people who push education, who push giving back to community, it was just a natural fit that I would end up in these spaces. I initially thought I was going to be an attorney. And after my junior year, I went, no, nah, I don't think that's going to be for me. But even in the work that I do, I still get a chance to advocate for people and try to look at ways that I can make their life better. So, and so that's kind of in a nutshell how it got started. Well, that's that's how you got started, but you have such a diversity of things that you do. Now, yeah. let's let's kind of take a quick leap from beautiful downtown Louisiana <laughs> <laughs> to what you do today. Are you there teaching in Dallas, or what do you what do you actually do? I have done um, some teaching with the University of North Texas at Dallas and their Human Service Management Leadership Program. But most of my work during the day is with the State Fair of Texas, which people are so surprised because how do you do this kind of work at a state fair? And I'm really fortunate that I have an opportunity every day to work with a wonderful group of people on a team to look at ways that we can use the resources at the fair to serve our neighbors. And so whether that's through providing grants, whether that being serve as a catalyst for relationships and leveraging, you know, what we have, we bring in 2.3 million visitors, you know, last year to our event. It's 24 mm. days. It's huge. And so being able to utilize the resources that we have, and then we're a convener to have all these people show up. I get a chance to convene people, you know, in nonprofit spaces, government spaces, you name it, to look at ways that we can better serve the neighborhood that our um, entity sits in. That's amazing because, uh, you know, my daughter and her husband live up in Maine. 
And we love to go to the state fairs up in Maine because you got the, it's just a great collection of great, just wonderful people. It is. And of course, when you go to a state fair, those of you who have never been to a state fair, you have to go around and you look around and you go to these different lectures. You can get educated at a state fair. It's not just looking at the cows. Of course, they're interesting in and of themselves anyway, and they're probably even more interesting in Texas. I'll tell you a story <laughs> about cows in Texas. You'll get a kick out of it in just a second. But so I'm, we're up there and you sit down and you can get a lecture from somebody about how they, you know, discovered the molting behaviors of butterflies, you know, and, and oh, yes. in great detail and be very enthusiastic about it. And it makes you want to take your little uh, handheld magnifying glass and find a butterfly and see if it's really true. You know, when you get done, it's a whole different world. Yes. So it's really just one heck of a lot of fun. It and, is. Uh, so you're pulling people together that do so many different things. You've got to have a very accepting big heart <laughs> because they're all going to be vying for places to present and what to do. And they want this and they want that. I can imagine because they're all celebrities in a certain sense, <laughs> you probably have to deal with celebrity entitlement. <laughs> well, you, you know, during the fair, I'm very fortunate that I don't have to deal with that space of it. I'm really happy to watch my colleagues have to deal with some of that. <laughs> I get to do a few events during the fair, but most of my work is after those 24 days are over, looking at how we continue to build in the community and doing things year round. We do college fairs. We just had an SAT camp. We work with our food bank to make sure kids get food during the summer, you know, so that they're, even though they may not be eating at school, they're still getting nutritious meals. And so looking at ways that we can use community resources to help our neighbors is what I spend a lot of time doing. So I don't get to, you know, necessarily have the celebrity entitlement stuff that, <laughs> that happens with the performers. And I'm very happy to say that that's not my experience. <laughs> well, and I, and I probably even shouldn't imply that at all about Texas, because I think that Texas and Louisiana, the places are so very cool. And the people are so accommodating and so nice and just such wonderful people that it's probably, I'm just kind of guessing because I, I have seen that kind of thing before when people are vying for space and, and looking yeah. for where they're going to be and so on and so forth. But it happens, granted, it happens, you know, because you have people who want to be able to come in and, and they look at the opportunities to make money. And so you have people who, you know, even locally who are vying for opportunities. We do a food cohort where I help small businesses think about looking at fairs and festivals as an opportunity to make money. Yeah, and yeah. even with that, those folks are looking at, well, how do I get to be at the State Fair of Texas and, and work with all these people that are coming in and for Texas OU weekend. So you do have some of that, but it, it's helping people understand the importance of building relationships, understand their own capacity and what they can do, you know, and, and managing expectations. Well, now, how do you actually do this? Now, forgive me for getting totally practical here, but <laughs> the very first thought that comes to my mind, putting myself a little bit in your shoes from this long distance perspective, would be it's almost like you'd have to have some training videos on how a person can go in there and transition into this multi-million people experience in some constructive way so they're prepared adequately for what they, what's expected of them if they're going to show up. How do, how do you actually do that? Well, with the people coming to the event, it's pretty much open. You know, we give out tickets for kids to be able to participate. So it's pretty open in terms of the 24 days. For the events that I do, we really are strategic about making sure that partners from the local neighborhood, whether those are nonprofits, whether it's working with our local United Way or businesses, some of that is, and you mentioned it earlier, is my interest in social capital and how do you build these relationships and community. Because of the work that I've been able to do for so many years, I've been able to build on that and have some relationships and have some trust that allow you to be able to come into communities and set up these kinds of programs and you know create these opportunities in partnership with people. I'm a really um, strong believer that when you're doing work in communities, it's in partnership. And how do you make sure that the people who are there actually have a voice and are in a position of leadership versus an institution coming in and going, this is what we're going to do and, and mm -hmm. this is best. I think it has to be done in collaboration. And I think, you know, not only my 
years of professional experience prepared me for that. But I think it's been the, the academic piece too, and being able to understand the importance of relationships and how those things can transform communities. It's not the programs. That's great stuff to have programs. You know, and it's great to bring people together, but what really creates a change that we want to see is through relationships. And you're looking for long-term relationships and you're looking at balanced relationships and you're looking at respectful relationships with individuals who really have never been at that kind of a venue before. You're really bringing along individuals from a completely different demographic to teach them how to connect and, and be productive in that situation, which is really such an important part for all of us as human beings. I mean, I can tell you right now, I've been to a lot of psychiatric meetings where they needed your help, girl. (laughs) I'm telling you. It's very interesting. There was a study that came out. I can't remember who it was by, but they were saying that in the next 10 years or 20 years, that the biggest skill that was going to be needed was people understanding how to be relational. And that is so wild to me that we spend so much time teaching folks how to do technology and doing all these different things. And yet the skill that they want managers and leaders to have is to be relational. Well, that speaks volumes that there's something that we're missing and not making sure that our kids and even the adults and communities don't understand how to get along. So let's talk about that concept of relational because I think it's one that's a little bit out of everybody's, that's in your vocabulary. You've been doing that for a long time. So, but let's take our listeners on a little trip with you about exactly what you're talking about when you're saying that, because it could be confusing for people. So let's talk a little bit about that. Well, I think the thing that we don't pay attention to is the power of relationships, especially from a science standpoint. There is so much data that has demonstrated what it looks like when people are connected to each other. One of the things I love to reference is the blue zone work where, you know, you've looked at these folks who live to be over 100 years old in these different communities around the world. And one of the things these folks have in common is, is that they're connected to people. They have a social circle and they have seen where all these people live. That is one of the commonalities that they have. They also have a place where they worship. So regardless of faith tradition, that they are coming together and thinking about something bigger than themselves in community. And so when you look at the research that even talks about when people are in connection with each other and they're having great conversations, what that even does to neurotransmitters where you're having, you know, the release of dopamine and serotonin and that people now are getting these happy feelings by being in community with each other versus the destructive things that we end up doing that can sometimes also give the same effect. So how do we help move people from this idea of being destructive or doing things that aren't in their best interest to really thinking about being in community and creating these relationships that have health benefits for not only longevity, but can really make a difference in the way that we're able to live together in the world. Can Corbrain Journal send you to Washington? (laughs) I think that's going to require exorcism and all kinds of other things, regardless of (laughs) of political affiliation. I think we've lost this idea of the collective. And somewhere along the way, it has become this idea of me. And not that you're not important, but if I'm not doing well, then, and you're doing well, at some point, there's going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. And so I think somewhere along the way, people lost the importance of family, lost the importance of understanding the power of being connected in community. And I think some of that is, you know, as great as technology is, phones are wonderful tools, but I also think technology has created, and you're seeing research that proves this, that people who are on Facebook are often depressed because you're comparing your life to someone else's life. So even in the great opportunity that technology presents, I think it can also create this distance and these facades that we have where we're not able to be authentic and come together and really have some tough conversations, be in community with each other. Not to say that that doesn't happen on social media, but I'm finding with more and more young people, they don't really know how sometimes to connect to people because they're so busy on their phones texting everybody and, and on these social media sites. And we're losing, in my opinion, a generation that doesn't have the dinner parties. You know, one of my favorite authors, yeah. he talks about, you know, at one point people used to have dinner parties. Folks don't do that anymore. No. I mean, d- just plain dinner parties alone. I mean, that used no. to be a lot of fun. What are we going to do? And and even in our social group, we 
occasionally have a neighborhood party, but you know, a dinner party is a little more intimate. Yes. You sit down and talk about things. Of course, we do it with family and our family, but you're right. We just don't do the same kind of, let's sit down and have a chat. And I think the real issue there, one of the, there are many issues. I shouldn't say this is, I don't mean to say this is the only issue, but you hit a uh, very important part that I am so strongly supportive of, and that is the idea of training mediation in grade school, training kids to mediate each other's problems in grade school. I totally agree. And start like in somewhere in the third or fourth grade. Yes. Like what is conflict? How do you resolve conflict? Who is going to take a leadership role in this dispute between these two people and come up with some ideas that might be a constructive win-win for these two people? And the skills that those kids are developing and doing that. So they learn very early. It's okay to agree to disagree. Everybody is not going to agree on the same thing. And that's okay to be in community and not agree. But we can still work together and respect each other. Somewhere that has gotten completely lost. And so, you know, the comment you made about the dinner parties, those were really neat places for people to have conversations and the intimacy that you talked about. We don't have that as much anymore when you think about it. Most of us, when we go home, we drive in our garage and go into our homes. We don't even know our neighbors. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I remember my daughter was telling me about one of her friends. The teacher died and no one knew she was dead for three days. Oh, my God. How does that happen? Because the community is not even checking on people. So the kids were wondering what happened to her. And the teacher is dead alone in her apartment. Wow. And you're seeing more instances of that, of people being socially disconnected and socially isolated. And you can't tell me that doesn't impact mental health. It's so true. And, I, and you know, we see it all the time because people frequently come in here with, with a flagging sense of their own identity. They they don't know who they are because they've never taken a position on anything. They'd, they don't know whether they like this person or that person because they don't know what they like, period. And then what happens is the interesting thing is they wind up being lost. So they're going to be silent because they really can't think of the thoughts because they're not really connected enough with themselves to express who they are or what their opinion is. My wife and I noticed this a long time ago. We lived in Philly and Philadelphia when I was taking graduate training in Philadelphia before we moved down here to Virginia Beach. And we noticed in the home that we had in Philadelphia, you could easily throw a, not a rock, but a tomato. (laughs) outside the window and hit the neighbor's house, you know. We were close to each we other. Very close. Yeah. So what happens, this wasn't an acre lot. This was like a quarter of an acre lot. And they were next door. And if they were shouting, you could hear them. And what happened was, and of course, if we were shouting, they could hear us. You know, not that we ever shouted, of course. But hey, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but the bottom line is that I think that whole level of even living and looking for the larger space to actually insulate yourself is part of it because we had such a great time with our neighbors there in Philadelphia because we regularly did that kind of thing. We did the party. We had a backyard barbecue and we had some uh, older people who were nearby. We always knew how old he was because he was born in 1900. Wow. So he was born in 1900 and he was in those days in the uh, seventies. And early, you know, in the early 70s, we knew exactly how old he was because he was born in 19. And he was like the barbecue guy, you know, and, and we had we had a great time because we were more intimate just in the neighborhood experience, which I'm sure you find happen all the time. And then when you get further into the suburbs then you have these layers of yes. uh, insulation from ordinary conversation, just as you were saying a moment ago. People don't know who their neighbors are. One of the things that I've been so surprised about is this app called Next Door. And it is an amazing app that lets you know what's going on in your neighborhood. And even for me, because I live in a suburb of Dallas, it's allowed me to get more connected to the people in my neighborhood. They're telling me who's coming down the street. I mean, you can tell the people are at home a whole lot, but they're telling you who's coming down the street, who's (laughs) stealing mail, what car drove by. And they're telling you some of the great things that are happening. Like, hey, Little League is And, you know, as disconnected as we are, technology is doing some things like the Nextdoor app to bring people together. And I think we've got to be more intentional 
about having the backyard park parties. It's more intentional about how do we congregate and get to know the people that are around us so you don't have the situation of the teacher who's been dead for three days because she may not have family in this space. Well, and you know, it brings up the whole point of meetings. I mean, meetings are almost not normal anymore from the point of view, everybody's going to do a webinar and yes. get their training sitting at home and then they can do it asynchronously so they can get it any time if they're up late at 11 o'clock, they can tune the webinar at 11 o'clock. They don't have to be there when everybody else is. And they don't have to negotiate of where they're going to sit or what they're going to do. So basically what happens is, and they don't have to really, I think the thing that is really important is in, from a psychiatric meeting point of view, Freud had this theory that he corrected. It, it wasn't Freud that had the theory of the people before him. They called the cathartic theory of mental health. So that if you had these humors rolling around in your body, if you got these humors out, you would be healthy. It was like a, like a bile. You know, so what happens is there was this cathartic theory. You know, if you ran around and shouted and barked like a dog, and there was an, actually a, a psychiatrist who said, Wilhelm Reich said, a Reichian therapist, you get down on all fours and you go around the, uh, the room and bark and really growl and bark that this was going to get these humors out of your system. Well, oh, wow. Now, what happens in the meetings, there was a long period of time where people thought that Freudian theory was based on getting the cathartic out. So everybody's like, I've just got to get these feelings. You've been in meetings like this. This is bothering me, and I'm going to tell you how I feel. Yes, yes. And completely disrespect the entire crowd because they have an affect explosion on nothing, really. But somehow they give themselves permission because they feel that way and feelings then need to get out because otherwise it's going to collect and become, create a boil in their brain or something like that. And that's psychiatry. And now that is not so much the way it is today, but there was a long period in psychiatry. You go to me, you wouldn't go to a meeting because that's what people would do. They'd go and they'd be officious and they'd argue and then they'd drop where they were from. I'm from Harvard. I just want to let you know that I'm from Harvard. Wow. So I can prove I'm smarter than you are. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Where did you go to school? And that whole, th it wasn't quite that officious, but it was in that direction. And therefore I have the, the chair. I remember I was in a meeting. It was a very interesting thing because I, I took uh, issue with some of the things that were being said in the meeting. There were about 300 people in the room. And one of the guys running the meeting who was hired by the pharmaceutical company to run the meeting was from Duke. Oh, wow. Now, I'm Chuck Parker. I'm not from Duke, okay? And we're in a wonderful venue that was paid for by the pharmaceutical company where we were talking about anxiety and a medication for anxiety. A specific medication at the time was Luvox, okay, for OCD, for having a cognitive anxiety associated with obsessional behavior. So, this is many, many years ago. I've been on the whole thing of cognitive anxiety for a long period of time. It's wow. an anxiety that exists separate and distinct. Pardon me for taking your time because I want to hear from you. No, this you is know. so interesting. So cognitive anxiety is different than affective emotional anxiety. But cognitive anxiety is not in the diagnostic book. Cognitive anxiety is thinking, worrying, fretting, analyzing. It doesn't have to be obsessional. It's just in your mind. It's not down in your body. And that's more dopamine related as opposed to serotonin, which is in your chest and your stomach and you feel bad and you're going to cry and you're going to get mad. That's all affective. So what happens is at this meeting, I said, well, you know, one of the things I've noticed is there's a really profound, people have not really been paying attention to cognitive anxiety, which is dopaminergically related. And if a person uses a serotonin product on a dopamine challenge, it's the wrong thing to do. And the Duke man, he didn't say, I'm from Duke, but he said... He let you know. <laughs> yeah. He, he kind of shut me up in the whole thing because he was like, don't be talking about that because you don't have any knowledge about that. You don't have any references or whatever that you can talk about it. So the bottom line there is that is the way meetings go. Instead of saying, hey, that's an interesting thing. How does that work in the context of what we're talking about? What, what's... How could it be helpful for us to understand that further, which would have been the correct thing to do? Right. Well, and, and the problem that we're seeing, even, you know, what you went through is we don't have the tolerance for someone to disagree. 
Yeah. So in a positive way and in a constructive way where we're open to learning, thinking about how do we create these spaces, one, for learning environments and saying that it is okay to share information, even if I don't agree with it, it's an opportunity to have a dialogue and and hopefully in a way that's constructive and, and we walk away well. But something else you mentioned that made me think about it is earlier, it's a narrative, I think is such a problem. People are uncomfortable with narratives sometimes, their own narrative or what they're accustomed to. So when you brought up the idea about, well, no, you know, how is this one of these neurotransmitters you're providing medication for it. And that's not where the issue is. I think it's very interesting when people are faced with something that's different or other, the narrative becomes one of, I don't know what to do with that and how to handle that versus going, that's a great narrative. Didn't know about that. Tell me more. And being okay with the narrative being something that may be different and challenging and uncomfortable. And and it's it's one of the reasons I'm doing core brain journal is because I'm learning really interesting things from a person like you just talking, just this type of conversation is let's really think about how we can grow that dialogue effectively and move forward as a human community. We're scurrying around on the face of the earth trying to advance the interests of our fellow human beings. And we can't do it by sitting around and pointing and arguing and having affective explosions at at meetings because it's so completely counterproductive, you know, and, and it is. exactly what happens is I'm totally with you on that. A person's uncomfortable. They haven't heard it before. So to them, that means it cannot exist. Yeah. Now, I'm often telling my daughter, she's 17, and I often tell her, I think the challenge is for many of us, we live in this space of it has to be either or. And the problem is what happens when you're confronted with a situation where it's both and? That both mm-hmm. of these realities exist in the same space, and they may be very different realities, but they exist. And I think for many of us, because the way our brains tend to categorize information, and we want to accept it just this way, when we're confronted with something that's very different, our brains go, I don't know what to do with that. So it's a cognitive dissonance moment where the brain is going, what do I do? And it's making the decision, do I continue to entertain this and allow it to grow and stretch me? Or do I stop it because it's uncomfortable and I don't want to deal with it anymore? That is so true. Now, here, we're going to take a break because this is a great conversation. You and I did not rehearse this conversation, I know. <laughs> not at but this all. Is, you're thinking the same way I'm thinking. You're down there in Dallas, and I'm up here in Virginia Beach, and I'm telling you, we are thinking exactly the same way. And I know what's going to happen when we come back. I'm going to ask you some questions about how you can help us, me included, think about ways to evolve that conversation constructively. What some of the techniques that you do, some of the ways, some grids and structure that you put on. So, folks, when we come back, we're going to take a, a brief break right here. And when we come back, we're going to talk a little more in detail about what Frostwa can tell us about the evolution of the dialogue constructively going down the road. So, folks, we'll be back in just a moment. Today, the world of mind, science, psychiatry, and mental health is rapidly changing with innovative, comprehensive testing that takes both patients and practitioners into a new world of measured details with useful, understandable, and remarkably actionable plans. The key phrase here is cost-effective. Testing also introduces a key parallel word, predictability. Psychiatric treatment failure, especially after multiple medications and our brief hospitalizations, arises directly from the complexity of measurable brain, body imbalances and impediments that explicitly interfere with medical outcomes and create costly difficulties with inadequately informed supplement and medication trials over time. Great Plains provides a leadership team of biomedical experts with advanced laboratory insights approved nationally both by the FDA and CLIA laboratory certifications and is available internationally for both public and medical professionals. Great Plains Laboratory is the primary laboratory we've used at CoreSight for years with excellent customer service for both patients and medical colleagues. They are on the spot, they get it every time. In addition, they provide exemplary training modules, which are webinars and conferences, in an effort to broaden practice perspectives wherever you live. 
Do follow up on one of these complimentary test offers today at http greatplainslaboratory.com forward slash CBJ. Yeah, that's Core Brain Journal CBJ. Well, welcome back, folks. You know, it's funny. I enjoyed talking to you so much. And, you know, I was raised in southern Missouri. So we were very close to Arkansas. And very close to Louisiana. <laughs> very close to Louisiana. And I've always had a great, our, our eighth grade class trip was down to Memphis. We went to the, oh, the yeah. we went to the burial mounds in Memphis. And oh, that's awesome. That's from Southern Missouri where I, where I, you know, spent a lot of time. And what's, I notice myself when I'm talking to somebody, you have no accent to me at all. You may, wow. others may think you have an accent. I don't think you have an accent. But I've Thank noticed, you. <laughs> I've noticed, <laughs> I use, like, I'm, instead of saying going to, I wind up saying gonna do to, you know, I, st- yeah. I sort oh, of yes. drop into the conversation. You know, yes, kind of I do that often too. My husband tells me he knows when I've been home because my vocabulary totally becomes <laughs> slurred. <laughs> <laughs> Slides a little bit, but, yes. well, now listen, I'm going to ask you that question because I think that, you know, something that these conversations like like we're having, I mean, we're not going to do this for everybody, but I think we just change the mind of one person out there and think about this thing a little more deeply about how we move the needle forward because we're talking about a very, very important process here. It's nothing smaller than the entire evolution of humankind, okay? That's what it is because how we human beings think is we think automatically defensively. Yes. We're automatic on defense. We're not automatic on construction. We're not automatic on building. We're automatic on putting up walls and thinking reductionistically with labels and just doesn't work. And uh, I've got references all over Core Brain Journal about that in my favorite books and so on. So I won't bother you with that right now. But And you know this already, I know. So the reason this is such an important conversation is here's a woman who's been all over, including a dog on UN. She's been teaching really all over the world, and she has very well-developed opinions about this, and I know there's no way you can summarize it in 15, 20 minutes, but if we could get started with that conversation, I think it'd be productive for our listeners. What kind of grids, how do you actually take those next steps? Do you have a specific book? Do you have a specific technique? Where do you go with that? You know, my favorite thing to do is the work of you mentioned earlier with uh, Keegan and Leahy with immunity to change. That is an amazing book because what it does is it forces you to look at adult development theory. And in the past, we thought that adults, once you got a certain age, your mind just stayed that way. I remember hearing my grandparents say, well, I'm just old, so I can do whatever I want to do. And this is just how I am. And what the book has basically demonstrated is that there are different levels of development that we go through even as adults and and our brain growth. And so between their work and then there's another gentleman, and I'm going to slaughter his name, but Robert Heifetz, who talks about adaptive leadership. Both of those are, are tremendous in helping you think about not only in leadership, but in your own life, why do we have these big you're creating the change. And so immunity to change is pretty much this x-ray of your thinking. And what I love about this is, is that they talk about that there are three states of, and I'm paraphrasing, that our minds are in. And you have people that are the socialized mind. You see them all the time where if you tell them the sky is blue, they're going to argue with you. No, it's not. It's got clouds in it. It is this color and this color because they only hear what they want to hear. And then they talk about people who have the self-authoring mind, which basically is, I hear everything you're telling me, but I'm going to filter it out to what I need to hear because the rest of the information really doesn't apply to me and doesn't matter. I only care about what involves me directly. And then the last mindset that they talk about is called the self-transforming mind, which basically is I'm able to understand what you're saying. I may have my opinion, but I can listen to you and get an idea of you know what you're saying. And God, I may not agree, but I understand where they're coming from. And what happens is for many of us, we move in and out of these states and these mindsets. We don't necessarily stay in one. The goal 
would probably be to be self-transforming, but let's be realistic. There are times when we are going to be socialized and go, that sky is blue, shut up and deal with it and let's go. So, <laughs> you know, I, I love that they, one, break it down, but then when they talk about immunity to change in this x-ray, it basically is, what is it that we want to improve upon in our lives? And they have you think about what is an improvement goal. And in that space, what you begin to realize is, is that sometimes the change that we want to make is a real simple change that's a one, two, three kind of, I want to do skydiving. Well, that doesn't require a whole lot of mental space. You just go sign up for a class. The mm -hmm. challenge is for many of the changes we want to make, they're adaptive changes. And Heifetz talks a lot about this. And the adaptive changes are things that change our behavior, that totally change the way that we think. And those are hard to do because they're not one, two, three. So weight loss is a, an exact thing that I always go about. Everybody knows what to do to lose weight. I know what to do. But if it were that easy, everybody would be so thin. It's not because it's changing our behaviors in the way we think and see ourselves. And what they bring up is this thing called competing commitments. So you may tell yourself, I want to lose weight, but there is something in your head that's telling you, no. And it goes back to emotions. So what is the emotion that's driving you to go, I can't do this. I'm afraid that if I'm successful in losing weight, I can't maintain it. And so that, and I won't go into a whole lot because of time and I get really excited about this, but that is such a wonderful tool to help people on an individual level, whether it's an organizational level or even a community society level to start thinking about what are the barriers in their thinking that keep them from achieving the change they want to see. You know, we're going to have you back, girl. I'm, <laughs> I'm getting excited just listening to you. So the deal is, it's really simple. Now, listen, the issue is I have to be sensitive about calling people girl because I don't know you that well. No, so. but that means we're friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you took it that way. I made the mistake of uh, calling a person girl who was from a publishing house in New York City who lived in Westchester. I, that was not the right thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I know some people get offended by it, but I say it all the time. And I have to remember, I call my mom girl and I'm like, oh, my goodness. Yeah. I shouldn't be do, doing that, but I'm like, girl, let's do this. So yeah. we're friends. That's it, yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's kind of an affectionate thing, even though I don't know you that well. So, <laughs> Well, we're friends, remember? <laughs> we are friends. We, we decided we were friends when we started. So, yes. so here's yeah. the thing. I do want you to come back because this, we've evolved this conversation into the next level it really has to take, okay? And that is we need to get into Kagan. We need to get into adult development theory, adaptive leadership. And we need to like break it down into like two or three basic things that any organization needs to address to make it evolve constructively and what your advice would be about that. You'll get a kick out of this because the interview just before yours was with a woman named Julie Simon, who's out in LA. And we were talking about some of the very same things, talking about, guess what, weight reduction and how people think about weight reduction and how what you have to do and the actual complexity of the whole process. And weight reduction is really just a metaphor for how you evolve in your, in your self-management. Yes, and how you're you, thinking. How you're thinking about yourself, how you're thinking about your relationship with your colleagues. Yes. So this is going to be good for us to come back and talk about it because to put it down a little bit, even if you want to put together a PDF would be great. Okay. Because if you had a PDF, like here are the things that we think everybody should know about. It doesn't have to be your PDF. You can just, but we'll get, you and I'll do a little bit of rehearsing on this thing so we can talk about it because we only have like 45 minutes to talk. But that would be fun. I think it would be people here who listen to us on a regular basis would love to come back and say, this is a very interesting thing that goes way beyond the state fair in Texas. And it's right. It's going to apply for the state fair in Texas. Why? Because you have such a diversity of human beings coming in. You would think at a state fair they have an agrarian mentality, but there's far more going on in a straight state fair than are the locusts coming to eat the grain, you know. <laughs> yeah, me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. So, well, this has been a great conversation. We do have yeah. to wind up because of the time and so on, but I'm really looking forward to our next conversation. You're me too. A delightful person to talk to. It's very, very interesting and and I think we just got into this. I was talking about the person I was talking about, and I'll have her name when I, I'll get her name, and I'm going to shoot her name to you just by talking about Kagan a little bit. 
got me all excited about having you on for this next conversation. And I got to have her on from New Zealand because that, that would be another, she's into yes. adult development and so on and so forth. So I'll shoot you by email. Uh, Great. Her name and her connections and so on. Cause you, you would love it. She's, she's a lot of fun. Great. So listen, tell us where we can connect with you and how we can do that. So we can uh, stay with you down the road. So you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm always posting stuff to help people. You can find me on my website, which is F-R-O-S-W-A-S rules, R-U-L-E-S.com. So it's frostwashrules.com. So any of those you can find me, it's very easy to do that. And I love being able to connect with folks and, and figure out ways that I can share information and make their lives better. I'll tell you, we're going to, it's going to be looking forward to it. I think another thing that we can talk about, I'm sort of creating a gen and we were winding up, but I'll just say one other thing. I think the whole nonprofit thing is a very big deal. It is. And I know nothing about it. And I think that there's some people who would benefit. I would benefit from learning and listening to you because you're very knowledgeable about it. But I know others of us out there, how can we actually do this to contribute to that larger good if we know something about some of that foundation, which fits with the topic of adult development anyway. So Yes, would love it. Just let me know. Well, Francois, thank you so much for coming down. I really appreciate it. I think I finally pronounced it correctly <laughs> because I got the Louisiana. I got the Louisiana. Thing. <laughs> you did. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to having you back next time. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you. Have a good one. Thanks for listening to Core Brain Journal. We're working every day behind the scenes to bring you reports that connect research benches with those street trenches. Here we share the complexity of mind science because as you know, details really do matter. One of the most pervasive misunderstood challenges is how commonplace medications like those written for ADHD are used so regularly without clear guidelines. If you think you'd like more specifics, take a minute to download my two-page PDF packed with video links and references on the absolute essentials of how to start ADHD medications. They're easily available at corebrainjournal.com forward slash start. Thanks for listening. Do connect and stay tuned. Together we can make a difference.